Kesser Jane. Welcome to my listeners in the United States and around the world. Tune in to the Hallie Kesser Jane Show at HallieKesserJane.com. Before we begin today's show, I want to share with you some exciting news. The Hallie Kesser Jane Show, already syndicated on so many stations, is now syndicated on all Amazon Alexa devices. Program your device, say the Hallie Kesser Jane Show, then have a listen. How easy is that? Enjoy. Now, this week on the Hallie Kesser Jane Show, it's Take Me Out to the Old Ball Game, when I talk to two men who know baseball well. Up first, Kevin Cook, whose new book, Electric October, Seven World Series Games, Six Lives, Five Minutes of Fame, That Lasted Forever, takes us back to 1947 and one of the most exciting World Series ever. And in the bottom of the hour, New York Yankees historian and former publicity director Marty Appel, author of the engaging biography, Casey Stangle, Baseball's Greatest Character. Let's play ball. Kevin Cook's new book, Electric October, Seven World Series Games, Six Lives, Five Minutes of Fame That Lasted Forever, takes us out to the old ball game. The year... 1947. The World Series, the most exciting ever in the words of Joe DiMaggio, with a decade's worth of drama packed into seven games between the mighty New York Yankees and underdog Brooklyn Dodgers. The players, six men who found themselves plucked from obscurity to shine in the sport's greatest stage, sore-armed Bill Bevins, a journeyman who knocked on the door of pitching immortality, Algie and Frito, and Cookie Lavaghetto, who came off the bench to play key roles for the Dodgers, Snuffy Sternweiss, a wartime batting champ who never got any respect, and managers Bucky Harris and Bert Schotten, each an unlikely choice to run his team. For some of these men, the 47 series was a memory to hold on to. For others, it would haunt them to the end of their days. And for us, Kevin Cook offers insights at once heartbreaking and uplifting into what fame and heroism truly mean. Kevin Cook is the author of the award-winning Tommy's Honor, now a feature film, and a former senior editor at Sports Illustrated who has written for the New York Times, Men's Journal, GQ, Playboy, Smithsonian, and Details. Let's talk. Before we even get into the book, I have to say that you... I'm thinking Red Barber. I'm thinking Phil Rizzuto. I'm thinking you could do it. You ah. could do the color. This book is written with that flavor, and that's why I love this book so much. Wow, great writing, great, well, great thank storytelling. You. Thank you so much. It's, it's just a lot of lot of great stories to tell. I tell you what, and you do them well. So let's talk. Let's talk 1947. Who knew this story? How'd you come across this? Well, I was initially fascinated by the matchup between Robinson and uh, DiMaggio, the two great stars that ever. Everyone remembers even 70 years later. It was Jackie Robinson's rookie year. Uh, he's all season going through horrible abuse from uh, other teams, particularly the Cardinals and the Phillies. Uh, and uh, but but a, a very very difficult year in which his manager Bert Schotten stuck with him through a slump. Uh, Robinson leads the underdog. Brooklyn Dodgers, who've never won a World Series, against, of course, the guys who always win, uh, the mighty uh, Yankees with the great Joe DiMaggio. Uh, there had never been a book written uh, entirely about the 47 series, so that was my initial thought. But the longer you spend researching, the more you see how much has been written about uh, not just DiMaggio and Robinson, but about the Yankees and the Dodgers. Really fascinating stuff. Um, but what was missing, it seemed to me, was the story of the unlikely heroes of that epic series. DiMaggio called it the most exciting World Series ever. And the guys who made it so exciting were the lesser-known players, the baseball mortals, like Cookie Lavagetto and Al Gianfrido and Snuffy Sternweiss. I love their names. I mean, let's talk about that for a second. You know, you write about the you know, sore-armed Bill Bevins, who called a journeyman, who knocked on the door of pitching immortality, Al Gianfrido and Cookie Lavagetto. Who came up with names, uh, Snuffy Sternweiss? I mean, 
you know, really, I, I, I just love this. And managers, Bucky Harris well, and Bert Schotten. But I want to talk about that. I want to talk about the characters because that was the greatness of baseball then in a way that maybe, you, you know, all right, Mantle and all of that. But I want to talk to you about that in a second, too. But, you know, Garrick, Stengel, what's yeah. the story with these heroes? The pre- Was it the press who made these guys so interesting? Why did they have names like this? Who are these characters? It's fascinating to me. It's baseball alone well, I think, has them. Yes, baseball certainly has has the most, uh, uh, more than any other sport, I think. And you could definitely count on your teammates in those days uh, to give you uh, an unflattering nickname if you had any distinguishing characteristic. So if you limped, you'd be gimpy for the rest of your life. Um, uh, Bill Bevins, one of the heroes of the book, his name was actually Floyd Bevins, but one day he slipped trying to catch a fly ball, and the ball came down on the bill of his cap and bounced into his glove. He was named Bill in honor of the bill of his cap. He always figured he was lucky that he didn't hit him a little lower. He would have been Nose Bevins for the rest of his life. <laughs> um, Cookie was named after a manager he had in the uh, uh, in the minors named uh, uh, another fellow named Cookie, and he was Cookie's boy. Uh, so these names kind of hang. Snuffy Sternweiss broke his nose playing uh, uh, college football. He wound up being Snuffy after that, uh, uh, and he didn't wasn't crazy about that name. He liked to be called George. It definitely makes the uh, cast of characters a, a good deal more colorful. More colorful and more real. You know, heroes, regular guys who get to the top, however brief their surge is. And isn't that part of the story that's so remarkable about baseball more than any other sport? Yeah, I think that's what really appeals to me in in this story and and in our current uh, uh, electric postseason and uh, and every postseason. That uh, in in the epic uh, World Series of '47, DiMaggio called it the most exciting ever. Even though he didn't play a huge role in the series, he was certainly one of the stars. But but the immortals, DiMaggio and Robinson, had to take a back seat and watch the heroes. These fellows who were were coming off the bench, Al Gianfrido is a uh, Defensive replacement, five foot six, the littlest Dodger, running at t- absolute top speed to rob DiMaggio in a, of a of a what they both thought would have been a home run uh, in in a key play uh, that that uh, causes Game Seven even to happen. It's all the contingencies in baseball. One of the great things about baseball, I think, is is it stops and lets us discuss what's going to happen next. Would you pinch hit? Would you take him out? Is it time to change pitchers? And all of those things change everything that happens happens afterward. So it's a very fruitful sort of dramatic uh, setting to enter into. And, um, you know, if you're going to write a book, you're going to spend a, a, more than a year of your life with these people. You're going to need to like them and be interested in them. I want to talk about Jackie Robinson just a little bit more because a lot of people probably don't know um, that he was a uh, you know, Brooklyn Dodger. He became the first African-American to participate in the event in this event. I mean, this is big stuff. Okay. You know, you want to you want to give him his due here a little bit. That's for sure. I mean, uh, Robinson uh, uh, had a meeting with Branch Rickey. Uh, it's been told many times, and including most recently in the movie, that for some reason had Harrison Ford playing with Branch Rickey. Um, but uh, Rickey challenged him and uh, and uh, said, "You can't believe the abuse that you're going to come into," and yelled at him in terms that uh, that would uh, make any of us blush. And and Robinson asked him in this preseason meeting before he ever signed a contract with the Dodgers, are you saying you want a man who's not brave enough to fight back? And Ricky said, I want a man who's brave enough uh, not to fight back, uh, to uh, to take the abuse that you're going to take and, and pave the way for others. And Robinson took that very seriously. Uh, he turns out to be uh, be a teammate who won his teammates over just by his example as a player. And yet... Another of his teammates, another a hero of this book, a man that I came to really admire, Cookie Lavagetto, signed a petition before the season began saying that many of the white players signed, I won't play with a black man. And uh, Cookie regretted that for the rest of his life. He told his son that it was a teammate brought it around, a friend named Dixie Walker. He didn't know Jackie Robinson at the time. He signed it for his friend. I think it's a sign of, uh, uh, of maturity, and it's something I admire that Cookie later in life regretted that, uh, became friends with Jackie, and uh, and uh, admired him, and and said so for the rest of his life. Besides the game, besides the player, there are other things that that, that are special about this. Like 
and and I think this is huge. And that's this was the first televised series. How to have changed the game? It was. <laughs> <laughs> it's going to change the game in a big way, and and it made for a somewhat comic uh, situations at the beginning. This is a time when people can't afford TVs in their homes yet. There are only a few thousand TV sets on the Eastern Seaboard where the broadcast is going. Most people see it in a bar, or they see it through an appliance store window. The screen is about the size of a toaster, and the f- players are about an inch tall. And since there's only one stationary camera anchored under the, the uh, grandstand, a lot of the action is someone hits the ball and then everyone runs off the screen. So uh, you're just kind of waiting to, to uh, deduce what happened next. Uh, it was terrifically exciting. It's still a radio sport. Millions are listening to Red Barber and Mel Allen on the radio. Uh, one of the tidbits that I came across uh, was that uh, the telecast – was was sponsored by Ford and Gillette, even though they were outbid for the TV rights by a Brooklyn brewery. And uh, the reason for that is that the commissioner of baseball, Happy Chandler, thought that it was just not going to work in the future for uh, beer to sponsor televised baseball. And we saw how that turned out. <laughs> Absolutely right. What would baseball be without its beer? Listen to That's me also. Sure. This. So the, the, the two managers, Bucky Harris and Bert Schotten, the Dodgers manager, he was actually filling in for the suspended Leo DeRocha. Tell that story. That's interesting. Well, DeRocha was such a colorful character, uh, had a lot of friends in the underworld. One of his best friends was George Raft, who was a big movie star who played underworld characters and was really buddy-buddy with a lot of legitimate uh, uh, crime figures. So that was the very dapper, perfectly dressed, uh, colorful, loud, profane Leo DeRocher's milieu. Uh, and it caught up with him, not necessarily because of the underworld figures, but because he um, he stole the wife of um, um, he, uh, another fellow. Her name was Lorraine Day. She was a Hollywood actress. Um, he broke up their marriage, and Lorraine Day uh, cast her lot with Leo DeRocher, married him. Uh, and uh, uh, a lot of people were upset with uh, Leo, including the commissioner, who suspended him that spring, during spring training, after he had had a meeting in which he told the Dodgers he didn't want to hear any more about the fact that they some of them said they wouldn't play with a black man because they were either going to play with Jackie Robinson or uh, they were not going to be Brooklyn Dodgers. Well, right after that, he's suspended, and Bert Schotten gets a telegram in Florida where he's working as a scout from Branch Rickey, come to Brooklyn, tell nobody uh, say nothing. And the next thing he finds out is he's going to manage the Brooklyn Dodgers in the tumultuous year of 1947, uh, which he does by wearing a suit and tie in the dugout, the last baseball manager to do so, because he promised his wife he was done wearing a baseball uniform. Uh, and I think that's a pretty good uh, idea when, uh, you know, even today we watch uh, baseball and the managers who are you know, men my age are pushing 60 years old and uh, not in the best shape, and they're dressed like they're going to go on the field and play. <laughs> I love that story. So you're talking about shady characters. Is there a story about Sinatra here? Uh, Sinatra was uh, uh, involved. He actually met, this tells you how uh, single-minded some of the, the baseball men were of the day. Uh, earlier in um, his career, uh, Bucky Harris, who managed the uh, Yankees in 47, had been the boy wonder manager of the Washington Senators uh, and was invited to soirees. Uh, that was the time when baseball was, the, the big stars were starting to shake hands with presidents as uh he did with President Calvin Coolidge. Well, later he comes to New York and everything is swirling around these Yankees. He finds himself at a meeting with a skinny young fellow and everybody seems to be paying attention to the skinny young fellow. Bucky Harris uh, asked his wife, who was that kid who was asking me about uh, the Yankees lineup? And she said, dear, you must be the only person in America who doesn't recognize Frank Sinatra. <laughs> really? Uh, there are other stories of, of interesting characters that kind of interweave their way into this 47th story. Hemingway is one of them. Talk about that. <laughs> Hemingway had a, uh, uh, a habit of challenging uh, athletes, uh, whether to boxing matches or uh, um to uh he wanted to uh teach them to go to the bullfights get them to go to the bullfights with him uh but he would uh, lace up uh, the uh uh 
boxing gloves uh, once he had a little bit too much to drink and uh, did that uh, with some ball players one day and uh, then uh, found himself uh, uh, knocked over a couch and picking himself up and saying, uh, let's have another drink. This was uh, Hemingway who fancied himself a great athlete and uh, then uh, actually when you put the gloves on with people who are real professional athletes, you're going to find out that uh, even if you're pretty tough for a writer, uh, you don't... Uh, you don't uh, win those matches very often. No. How about Harry Truman, the president? Harry Truman. Well, uh, President Truman, uh, after uh, World War II, of course, uh, uh, he's going to uh, uh, to uh, desegregate the armed services at long last. Uh, partly, I think, to the uh, uh, due to the example Jackie Robinson set, becoming a national hero in 1947. Uh, Truman was a uh, baseball fan um, who uh, did not get out to uh, throw out the World Series uh, uh, first pitch. He was uh, busy at the time, but uh, certainly followed it uh, and and was part of the uh, presidential tradition of uh, uh, of uh, following the game and uh, considering baseball the true national pastime, which before this time, before the mid-40s, uh, you could still make a case that boxing was the most popular sport. Uh, horse racing was, was still huge. College football was uh, much bigger, uh, even than the NFL. Uh, and it was really in the post-war time that, uh, that was the golden age of baseball. When I think of as baseball as the true national pastime, uh, this was it. And there was never a better time than, uh, than the 47 series. And I'm going to say this to you because I have this on my list of things I want to talk to you about, and that's about the national pastime. You know, for years now in our generation, because I know you're about the same age as I am, so to speak, and we grew up in a time when baseball, I grew up with baseball in my house because my father was friendly with all the mm-hmm. Yankees and I had all of them in my house. I was very fortunate to know a lot of people. I could tell you stories yeah. you could write about. But <sighs> then it took a backseat to, to football. And Mm-hmm. I, I, there are a lot of things you can consider in in that reality, uh, the times, the kind of morality we're all living, you know, the anger, the uh, even the uh, I think economics has something to do with it. But but I'm getting the feeling now and tell me if I'm wrong after all the drug problems and the Pete Rose problems and all of that. Right. Don't you think you feel it? It's coming back that there's a surge that baseball starting again to get a little respect or maybe that's just I'm uh, wishing. I, <laughs> Talk to no, me. I, I think you're you're definitely onto something. I I think it was uh, there was definitely a period in the in the 1970s when Monday Night Football was a phenomenon and NFL football realized for the first time what a perfect TV sport it was. Uh, in many ways, a better TV sport than baseball. Um, and and NFL football. The speed and the violence suited the 70s and the 80s in a way that baseball began to seem like your pop sport, like a, like an older kind of pastime, even with a nice name like that. Nobody calls football a pastime. I think we're now seeing that uh, that NFL football is uh, facing an existential crisis. Nobody wants their kids to, uh, even football players don't want their kids to uh, suffer in the way that uh, that football players almost necessarily suffer. There's no helmet that can stop a concussion because a concussion comes from your brain's moving inside with a quick change of direction. So your brain gets bruised from the inside. There's no helmet that can stop that. Uh, you can certainly change the rules. But I, I think also football comes to seem so corporate and, and driven by money in a way that baseball is also totally driven by money, but uh, at least has more uh, more history um, and, a, and a longer history. And I think we are coming back to a time when uh, baseball lends itself to contemplation. It's, it's quantized in a way that you gives you time in between plays to talk about, are you going to change pitchers now? Or are you going to bunt now? These things really reward close attention. Uh, Tony LaRusso once said that uh, the one thing about baseball is the closer the attention you pay to it, the more you appreciate it. And, and I think that's, that's going to be a good thing for baseball in the near future. And I, and I think, A, is the thinking man's game or woman's game, as I, I always thought. I think that's part of the contemplation. But but maybe in this time when everything moves so fast, maybe it's nice to sit down for a couple of hours or a few hours and watch something that's a little bit more uh, gently paced. I think that might have something to do with it as well. I want to talk to you about this. People in their 15 minutes of fame, you know, that, that old famous thing. 
as a result of the 47 series, so many of these guys' lives were changed, some for good, some for bad. You, you talk to me about that. Is, is there one story of what happened to one of these guys that you want to kind of give us a taste of so that when people want to pick up this terrific book and read the whole story? Well, yes, I, I think there. Um, it's it's worth knowing that Cookie Lava Jato and Bill Bevins were twinned forever. Later later on, with the shot heard around the world, it, the same thing would happen to Bobby Thompson, who hit the shot, and uh, Ralph Branca, who gave it up. But uh, Bill Bevins in the 47 World Series is within and out of pitching the first no-hitter in World Series history. He knew, everybody on both teams knew, every fan knew, this was the brink of, of history. He gives up a double to Cookie, who will celebrate that moment for the rest of his life and be given pats on the back and sign autographs, get free drinks forever for that heroic moment, while Bevins would spend the rest of his life as the man who almost pitched the first no-hitter in World Series history. They're going to pose together at old-timers games, which is a much more pleasant uh, thing for Cookie than it was for Bevins, who's grinding his teeth throughout all of that. Um, and as you say, the, the fact that much more so for men like them than for superstars like DiMaggio and Robinson, that moment in the in the sun, that moment of national fame, affects your life every day, uh, ever after. Um, just real quickly to, to mention a, a moment that I liked was uh, Gianfrido makes a great miracle catch to foil DiMaggio and keep the Dodgers in it and send it to a seventh uh, game of that series. And uh, many years later, Al Gianfrido, who spent his whole life signing autographs, uh, he signed a picture that had a picture of the play, and he said, I robbed Joe D. Well, his nephew tracks down Joe DiMaggio in Joe's restaurant and says, hey, you know, I'm, I'm related to Al Gianfrido, who made the catch. And uh, DiMaggio takes a moment and looks him over and says, is that little SOB still alive? <laughs> uh, these things uh, these things last and last if you have a, a, a moment in baseball. And I think the players knew, and, and it would be true, that when their obituaries were finally written, it would say, for instance, Al Gianfrido, 81 years old, had key uh, catch in 47 World Series. You know, it's so funny. I'm sitting here and I'm listening to you tell the story with great color. Like I said, you could be Mill Allen. What's with baseball? Is there any other sport that is told so fabulously well with such great graphic design, you know, great adjectives <laughs> than baseball? It has a language all its own. You know, and language is so missing from the American culture these days. You know, you, you, I don't have to tell you, you know, rap. I mean, but, but not baseball. Even, and I think there's some bad guys doing this kind of stuff today, which is one of, I think, baseball's problems on air, by the way, because I don't think they have the kind of people that we used to have. I knew Rizzuto well. I knew uh -huh. Milan. So I say to you that, what's with the, what's with the phraseology? I, did you get into that at all? Because to me, that's just fascinating how, you tell it and everybody tells it in a way nothing else is told in America. Baseball has its own language. That's right. And I think it's because baseball has such a long history. Uh, you know, here, here's um, uh, the great Red Barber, uh, who along with Mel Allen called that series, had his terms because he says he's from Mississippi. He says, uh, oh, they're, they're leading by three. They're sitting in the catbird seat. Um, he has he has a terrific terminology, a rhubarb uh, for a baseball argument, uh, uh, and I and I found while working on this book, it, it occurred to me uh, why is spring training called the Grapefruit League? Spring training was beginning uh, in in the early part of the 20th century. Teams would go down and, and practice in good weather, uh, and they would do it in Florida. Well, why didn't they call it the Orange League or the Seashell League? And that's because uh, in, in the teens, uh, Wilbert Robinson, then the manager of the uh, Dodgers, who was a catcher, said he could catch a ball dropped from an aeroplane, which would have been quite a feat. Nobody had done that before. So uh, they took up a bunch of bats and uh, and uh, hired the fabulous feminine flyer, whose name escaped me right now, but she was the Amelia Earhart of Florida. She agreed to do that, except that she forgot the baseball. So she's about to take off, and one of her friends hands her, one of her grounds crew hands her a grapefruit. And so she's flying 500 feet over the field with Uncle Robbie, Wilbur Robinson, down below waiting. She drops it, and here comes the missile down, and he's expecting a baseball. It hits him, explodes in a, in a spray of grapefruit pulp, and he thought the baseball had gone right through him. And he was killed, and he's writhing around saying, oh, God, I'm killed. After the players finish laughing and, and claiming their bets, 
they tell everyone the story, and spring training becomes the Grapefruit League. So that's one of the fun bits of language that baseball contributes uh, just through its long, strange wonderful history. Oh, that's a great story. That's great. I'm in, in Vero Beach, Dodger Stadium. Here we go. Quiet. Uh-huh. It's no longer here, but hello. I mean, right. Going through this whole whole experience for you must have been extraordinary. Tell me quickly what surprised you most. Um, I, I was surprised to, to, to find that uh, how much these players who participated in a huge way in the uh, one of the most exciting, famous World Series ever, how quickly they could be forgotten. Burt Schotten was utterly forgotten, scouting within, within a decade. Bucky Harris, forgotten until his son uh, took up a campaign to get him into the Hall of Fame, which paid off in 1975. Um, the players themselves uh, remembered mostly by their families, um, but they were always those guys who were the heroes of 1947 and that lived with them every single day i was i was surprised to to find myself really falling for in, in the, for the bravery that they had as they faced illness these very physical creatures to you know whose whole lives had been about their athletic prowess and and the different ways and the courageous ways that they faced illness later in life and the ways they remembered their careers i mean you you know, if you have three years in the big leagues and you're 78 years old, that's not very much uh, a portion of your life. But in each case, that's the one that meant the most to them. And uh, uh, my goal then is to uh, introduce new readers to to these people that I came to admire, to like, and and to really uh, empathize with, and uh, and hope that in a small way they'll uh, they'll have a, another uh, October in the in the sunlight thanks to the book. I've been speaking with Kevin Cook. His book, Electric October, Seven World Series Games, Six Lives, Five Minutes of Fame, That Lasted Forever. For more information about Kevin and his book, visit Amazon.com and find bookstores everywhere. You were listening to The Hallie Kessler Jane Show. My guests today are Kevin Cook, the author of Electric October, Seven World Series Games, Six Lives, Five Minutes of Fame That Lasted Forever, and Marty Appel, author of Casey Stengel, Baseball's Greatest Character. Tune in to the Hallie Kasser Jane podcast, nearly 300 episodes available at HallieKasserJane.com. We'll be back in a minute. Stay with us. Casey Stengel once said, there comes a time in every man's life, and I've had plenty of them. And indeed, he did. There was nobody like Casey before him, and certainly there has been no one like him since. And no one defined baseball more than he did. For more than 50 years, Casey Stengel lived baseball. First as the only person in history to play for or manage all the New York teams, including the Dodgers, Giants, Yankees, and Mets, and then as a manager where he made his biggest mark on the game revolutionizing the role in New York and beyond, all while winning an astounding 10 pennants and seven World Series championships, including five consecutive titles with the Yankees. But who was Charles Casey Stengel? As the historian of the New York Yankees, no one is more qualified than Marty Appel to write Casey Stengel, baseball's greatest character, the definitive biography. In his eminently readable book, Appel takes us from Stengel's youth to right up to his death at the age of 85, painting a picture of a boy obsessed with sports to a man most beloved who made clowning around on the baseball diamond commonplace, the kid from Missouri who became known as the old professor. And yet, Stengel has always been an enigma, even as he won the love of fans and players alike. Take us back to the old ball game, Marty Appel. Let's talk. So, Marty, first, I wonder, what do you think Casey Stengel would think about Major League Baseball as the game is today? Would he be happy with it or not? I think not, and I think it's because the manager is uh, not as important as it was in Casey's time. And when I say that, what I mean is that today the managers are handed all the computer printouts with what everybody does in every situation. And in Casey's time, it was all in his mind, and that's sort of what separated him from less managers intuitively he remembered things he remembered what happened in April and now it's September 
and the guy's bat is the same, so he's not going to get around as fast as he did in April. Little things like that distinguish Casey. And also the part about instant replay determining close plays. Well, he liked going out on the field and arguing with the umpires. It would pump up the crowd. It would pump up his team. And now you don't see that because it's all decided back in a studio in New York. So uh, I'm not criticizing that system's in place. I'm just saying Casey would have not enjoyed losing those aspects of his skills. Gotcha. You know, we all have an image of Casey Stengel in our minds, and I know that uh, I certainly do. Did, did you know him personally, number one, and how close to the public image was the real man? Well, I knew him just a little bit. Uh, I was the one who arranged for him to come to Yankee Stadium for Old Timers Day each summer for the last five years of his life. And those were the only Old Timers Day appearances he made. So I got to interact with him in that case, and I had some nice memories of that. But I wish I had known him, you know, like the players did who worked for him, because when I interviewed them for the book, they also had such great stories and such admiration for him. I think it's important to know that you brought a lot of new material into this book. Talk a little bit about that, because this really is groundbreaking from you. Thank you. At first, when I was offered the assignment of doing the book, I was a little intimidated because Bob Creamer wrote such a good book 30 years ago, which is like considered a classic. But I wound up with some things available to me that Bob Creamer didn't have. First, he didn't have the internet, and I was able to use it to go into the archives of small little town newspapers where Casey played in the minor leagues and uncover long lost anecdotes which fit well into the book, and we got a better look of him as as a young man playing minor league ball. And then the big thing was getting a memoir from Casey's wife, Edna Stengel. She wrote a full book, a full life story memoir in 1958, which was never published. So the family was good enough to lend that to me. And from that, he was able to see a whole different side of Casey Stengel, not just Casey the baseball personality, but Casey the husband, Casey the suitor, Casey at home. It was uh, revealing and it was uh, fascinating, and I think it really added to the book. I think it definitely added to the book. I love that part of it. We're going to discuss a little bit about it as we go along. He was born in Kansas City, Missouri, the youngest of three children, Charles Dillon Stengel, and he was an avid athlete. What, what about his character? How, how much of who he became do you think was rooted in this youth of his? Well, one of my favorite anecdotes from his childhood was that he and his brother liked to throw snowballs at men with pipes to try and knock the <laughs> pipe out. And that was the feisty, combative side of Casey that was always there, even on in, into his later years. He was a character, and uh, that sort of captured it as uh, in childhood. He played baseball, football, and basketball at Central High School in Kansas City and played baseball well enough to get signed to a professional contract before even graduating. So uh, that was an interesting aspect of discovering Casey didn't graduate high school but had an earned enough credits where he was able to go to dental college uh, in his first few off-seasons as a minor league player. I, I don't know that a lot of people know that he, he he wanted to be a dentist. I guess he really was a dentist for a minute or two. He just, uh, it was a problem well, for him. Well, he never graduated dental school, so he wasn't really a dentist. What was fascinating to me was that he went for three years or three semesters and decided that it wasn't a profession for him because he was left-handed and it was very difficult to get left-handed dental equipment. My question, which I pose in the book, is what took them three years to figure that out? <laughs> that could have been on the first day, you think? <laughs> yeah, really, right? You know, whatever. I guess it was a guy who was going to try and do it, and no matter what, until he couldn't do it, and there you go. The word character, let, let me just uh, change uh, pace for a second here. I love this word character. Uh, you, you know, there's a, that's a special word, and it's not used for everybody, right? When you say somebody right. is a character. Define what you mean by character and why he so fits that word. It's like they were well, made for guy, each other. He, he was a guy that you noticed. Uh, he was no wallflower, whether it was on the field or in the hotel bar or um, anywhere in his life. He had an oversized personality. He loved people. He considered fans to be just as part, much a part of the baseball community 
as were his players and front office people and writers. So he embraced a wide net of people that made up the baseball circle. Uh, he was a character because of little stunts that he pulled all along the way, including when he famously released a sparrow from under his cap that <laughs> flew up in Ebbets Field. Um, right till the very end, when he was charming the New York sports writers and diverting attention away from how bad his New York Mets were. Oh, God. So it really never left him. Yeah, we all could have spent some time with him. Think of how wonderful our lives would have been if we had just gotten That's a little right. bit, of, well, a little bit of what he had in that character. All right, so he becomes a baseball player, and in fact, as a player, he began in 1913 as the first Brooklyn player to bat, and subsequently homer at Ebbets Field. That was something I did not know. Yeah, he hit the first home run in Ebbets Field. It's worth noting that he came up in September the previous year. Worth noting because. That was when the Dodgers were playing in a place called Washington Park, a really dilapidated, almost worthless ballpark. But he played his first games there, and he played the last game in Washington Park and then the first game in Ebbets Field the following year. And just a little bit more trivia, he was the first to hit a home run in the New, York, New Yankee Stadium too, right? The first World Series home right. run in the New Yankee Stadium. And that was a classic Casey Stengel moment because... Uh, he hit it under the spotlight of the biggest crowd he'd ever played before, Yankee Stadium. And he was already thought to be an old man by 1923 by baseball standards. And he was huffing and puffing his way around the bases, seemingly yelling out loud, Go Casey, go Casey, to himself out loud. Uh, the fielders <laughs> heard him as he was chugging around the bases. And he thought while he was circling the bases that he lost a shoe, but it was actually just a little rubber insole that was inserted into the shoe because he had been injured. So this little insert flew out. He thought he lost his whole shoe, and he slid home, and he said to the on-deck hitter, Hank Gowdy, I lost a shoe, and Hank Gowdy looked down and said, how many were you wearing? <laughs> <laughs> That's a great one. I love it. <laughs> you know, that's very funny to me because nobody thinks of him as a baseball player, which is really strange. You know, he is just the manager. But what kind of player was he all in the, in the big picture of it? He played 14 years. He hit 284, so he was a little above average. He, If they had all-star games back then, he might have been selected once or twice. He had some good years. He had some bad years. It was hard to determine whether he was truly a really good player, but on the scheme of things, a little above average. And what about his heart? Was his heart as a player? Oh, yes. And um, actually, I should add, in the late 40s, the Brooklyn Dodgers began to assemble these boys of summer, this great team with Jackie and Campy and Duke Snyder and everything. Before that era, if you talked about the best outfielders in Brooklyn Dodgers history, Casey's name would be in the conversation. I mean, it wasn't a lot to choose from because they weren't very good all those years, but Casey would be in the conversation. I think that's important to mention, particularly to the new generations that may not, you know, be aware of that. I want to talk about his name because I, I know, but I, I don't know that a lot of people understand how he got his the name Casey, but, but he was Dutch to begin with. I, I think of Dutch Reagan too, right? Wasn't he also Dutch? At, <laughs> that was like the yeah. name of the the time. Uh, talk to us about how he uh, got to be called Casey Spangle. Well, uh, a lot of people's nicknames had to do with where they were from, and the likely scenario is that as a rookie, somebody might have said to him in the clubhouse, hey, rookie, where are you from? <laughs> and Casey might have answered the shorthand for Kansas City by saying, KC, and a nickname was born. There you go. You know, I'm I'm talking to you, but I have to tell you something. I think you're a mini Casey Stengel. You got a character. You're a character. Who oh, knew? <laughs> I think writing the book <laughs> brought Thank that out. You. It's terrific. <laughs> keep coming. Let's talk. Let's keep talking. I love it. Oh, it's cute. He also had a temper, though, right? There is a story. I this was another one that I had never heard. At one point, when he was playing, he threw a bat at someone, and the police were called. What? Yeah, he had some, some notable fights along the way, on the field and off the field. Um, <laughs> it was part of what made him feisty, but also part of what attracted him to a Brooklyn Dodgers scout back in 1912. Uh, he was playing in the minor leagues. He was playing near Chicago, Aurora, Illinois. And the scout for the Dodgers was in Chicago, 
and he took a train direct route out to Aurora to watch the minor leaguers play. And in Casey, he saw a fairly talented guy, but also he liked that Casey had blonde hair and blue eyes. And he said, those blonde hair and blue eyed kids, they're always fighters. (laughs) <laughs> and he liked that. So Casey skipped triple A ball. He went right from the low minor leagues of Aurora into the major leagues with the Dodgers. I'm going to remember what you just said on blonde and blue eyed. Truly. Well, there you go. So you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> I get it. I get it. I get it. I want to talk about Edna because I think she's critical to who he is and what he becomes and how he chooses to live his life. Could you tell us a little bit about he and his wife and their marriage? They met when they were in their 30s. They were introduced by another ball player whose wife was a friend of Edna's. They met at the polo grounds. Casey, for all his outward personality, I don't think was much of a ladies' man. He was a good dresser and he was a good dancer. But unlike a lot of players who really spend a lot of time pursuing women, I think Casey was all baseball and really not that comfortable in dating situations. But he liked Edna. He was smitten by her. And he pursued her to the point where it was time to ask her to marry him. And as she writes in her memoir, he never really proposed. There was never really a I love you, will you marry me moment. They were walking down the street and he suddenly said, so you want me to convert to Catholic or what? (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> and that was the proposal. <laughs> they had a pretty long, they had a long life together, and they had a good life together, didn't they? They did. They never had any children, probably owing to the fact that they were in their 30s when they married, and people in their 30s usually didn't have children back then. But uh, they were devoted to each other, and without the children, Edna was generally by Casey's side. She would be on at all the games, make the road trips, and he was happy to have her there. They really got along great. So the playing days are over, as will happen, and he becomes the manager. Talk about, briefly, if you can, just kind of give us a synopsis to get us to Yankee time. Okay. Well, it's a it's a long odyssey, but I'll give it the short version. <laughs> uh, in his last years as a player, he played for John McGraw of the Giants, McGraw was considered the best manager in baseball, and Casey would sit by his side and learn a lot in the dugout. He'd see a play that he thought was a good play and say so, and McGraw would say, that wasn't a good play, and here's why. And Casey's eyes would open. He'd really see another side of baseball he hadn't seen before. So he starts out managing in Worcester, Massachusetts, quickly moves up to a high classification team in Toledo, has a winning season in Toledo, but some bad ones as well, has a couple of shots in the major leagues, managing Brooklyn unsuccessfully and Boston unsuccessfully, two low-budget teams without very good players, and without good players, he didn't do very well. Back to the minor leagues, a stop here, a stop there, finally out to Oakland, California, where he wins the Pacific Coast League Championship in 1948. That was a big deal in baseball back then, because there were only 16 major league teams. Today there are 30. So you could almost say, well, the next 14 teams in the minor leagues would be the equivalent of major league teams today. Uh, And that was true in case he won the Pacific Coast League Championship and what they called the Little World Series in 1948, which kind of got him noticed again in the major leagues. So the Yankees had an opening, and they shocked the world by hiring Casey, who was thought to be more of a clown than a managerial genius. Uh, And that brings us to 1949 and the start of his run with the Yankees. Extraordinary story. Extraordinary, right? I, and I don't know that we'll ever have anything like that again. You know, how many of those come um, along in a, in in a in a you know season, if you will? Uh, it's true, and uh, but it was a different time for baseball, and it was a time when there were managers who really never emerged out from the minor leagues, who just made a living doing that. Casey was lucky at age fifty nine to get a chance to manage the glamour franchise of all of baseball. Mm, mm -mm. He said, there is less wrong with this team than any team I ever managed, featuring stars like Yogi Berra, Joe DiMaggio, Phil Rizzuto, and a young Mickey Mantle. I'm going to Mickey Mantle. Let's talk Mickey Mantle. 
They had an interesting okay. they had an interesting relationship, didn't they? Well, Mickey came up in 1951, which was DiMaggio's last year and Casey's third year. Mickey was all of 19, and he was so talented. He it looked like he could be Babe Ruth, except he hit with more power from both sides of the plate, and he ran faster. So Casey took a look at Mickey Mantle and said, "Oh my God, what have I got here?" So in his mind, Casey always wanted Mickey Mantle to be his own Babe Ruth. And despite winning two Most Valuable Player Awards and a Triple Crown and going to the World Series every October, Mickey didn't quite meet Casey's expectations. And in the end, Casey always was disappointed that Mickey wasn't even better than he was. (laughs) It was pretty rough to play under those circumstances, and Casey was never that public about it. But that's the way he felt, that Mickey still had greater promise than he showed. To me, that's extraordinary. Now, you know that I knew him, right? Because we talked off air how well I knew him. And and, uh, in my house, by the way, you couldn't listen to a baseball game and talk when you were eating. (laughs) You had to take your your, your plate one outside if you dared to talk while my dad was listening to a game. But, I mean, I, I don't get that. But is there something I need to get to understand why he was so disappointing? No, I think it was pretty clear cut. Casey was a meat and potatoes guy. There weren't any subtleties with him. Mm -hmm. If he wanted you to perform at a certain level and you didn't, ultimately you were disappointing. And Billy Martin, his second baseman, was a guy who played above his abilities. Just putting on the Yankee uniform made him better than his natural talents. So Casey loved what Billy Martin was able to give him. I I, I just, I find it just, you know, my head. So... I told you off to air a personal story. Some of my listeners have heard it from me before. I kind of was lucky. I grew up with all these guys in my house. My dad was friendly with people like Ralph Terry and Mickey Mantle and, and uh, Elston Howard. And story that I told you off air was about the fact that nobody could get how a black man tried to rent a home. And in those times, that wasn't so easy. So my dad found him a home in Teaneck, right near my grandparents, as a matter of fact. And so that was something my father was always proud of. And we, were, as a family, were proud of. But, you know, there's talk about integration of blacks into baseball. Did Casey Stengel stand in the way of integrating the Yankees with African-American players? Because there is talk about well, that. It, it, it's a complicated question, as all issues of race are in America. It's our most difficult issue as a nation. Sure. has been for a long time. So the answer has a lot to do with, on the one hand, on the other hand, <laughs> and here you go. <laughs> um, Casey grew up uh, in segregated schools in Kansas City and played all-white baseball, but he did play against Negro League teams. His best friends in high school were Jewish, and by all um, by all imagination, I think he was a pretty ecumenical guy. Mostly, he just loved baseball and loved winning and loved good players, and I think he always wanted black players on the Yankees because he saw the Dodgers had Jackie Robinson and the Giants had Willie Mays, and where's mine? He just wanted to win, and it didn't matter to him what the color was. Now, Jackie Robinson criticized the Yankees for their slowness to integrate, and KC, being a good company man, defended his bosses, um, saying the Yankees are not deliberately segregating. We just haven't found the right guy yet. Uh, when Elston Howard came along, that was so much the right guy. He fit in immediately, and KC needs to get credit for creating an environment where Elston was so welcome. The Southern players, the Southern coaches, no, there were no issues. Elston was immediately part of the team, did all social activities with the team. Did Casey extend himself to helping Elston Howard get housing? No. Did he help him in Florida in spring training when black players had to stay at separate hotels? He didn't. He accepted what was in America to a large part, but in other places he stepped out and he made Elston Howard very welcome. Uh, His famous quote from that time was considered to be racially tinged. It was, I finally get one and he can't run. (laughs) So everybody laughed and said, ah, what a great joke from Casey. And everybody focused on it as being racist oriented. Um, But the first part of the quote is forgotten. I finally get one. He was waiting for his turn. The Dodgers had Jackie. The Giants had Willie. Where's mine? So as you can see, it's an uneven scorecard. 
But in the book, I generally come out as Casey did okay under the circumstances for a guy born in 1890. And and that was what I was going to uh, say back to you. Remember where from whence this guy was coming and the, and the time, because times are slow to change, as we know. He was known for his repertoire of odd sayings that would be affectionately dubbed Stangleys, kind of like Yogi right. Bearers, you know, yogiisms. Talk about that. Where where did all that come from? That just some of them are so brilliant and so funny. Um, it was interesting that he was paired for so many years with Yogi Berra, and Stengalese and Yogiisms <laughs> are part of American culture today. <laughs> you find them in Bartlett's quotations, and uh, he, they were both so notable for that. Yogi's Yogiisms used to be two or three word sentences with a lot of grunts thrown in. And then you'd later on figure out, oh, it was brilliant. With Casey, they were just the opposite. They were these long, run-on, punctuation-free sentences that he would use to confuse people, to avoid answering, to stall for time until he thought of the answer, all sorts of uses for them. And they totally amused uh, the writers, and the writers knew what he was doing. He was deflecting attention away from whatever the challenging question might have been at the time. Uh, he most famously used it in the U.S. Congress when he went to testify in 1958, and he was asked one question about the state of baseball today, and he proceeded to give his life story in about a 20-minute uh, soliloquy with no punctuation marks at all. <laughs> <laughs> it's great stuff, the guy. <laughs> they don't make them like I said, like they used to, and that's for no. sure. And they really don't. Anyway, what goes up, what comes down? Yankees, 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 high on the hill, and then, then they're not so great. And goodbye to the Yankees, says Mr. Stangle, or Mr. Stangle, the Yankees say to Mr. Stangle, and he winds up with the Mets, the new team, the Mets. And and just briefly, give us a little bit about the Mets, because we're, we're coming up against our uh, hard finish here. Okay. Well, um, it was a whole different experience for him in the sense of having been with the Yankees for 12 years and been to 10 World Series in that period. Now with the Mets, he was sort of back to where he came from with a terrible team like he had managed in Brooklyn and Boston. And he knew that his primary function with the Mets was to draw attention away from the inept ball playing and onto the fun of the Mets and the youth of America and everybody's going to grow up being a Metsies fan. He was delightful with the writers. They loved him. He was a wholly disengaged manager. The coaches made up the lineup and worked up the pitching rotation. Uh, his center fielder, Richie Ashburn, really ran the game on the field. And Casey was known to snooze in the dugout. <laughs> he was now 72 years old. He was forgiven for it. But he certainly wasn't as engaged as he'd been all those years with the Yankees. His line that he said at the time, can't anybody here play this game? <laughs> right, which Jimmy Breslin, who just passed away, yeah. turned into the title of a book, which just further helped make the Mets charming. Absolutely. So he, he broke his hip, he retires. I want to get to... He broke his hip, yeah. he retired. Uh, he probably would have chosen to go go on, but he knew if he couldn't go out to the mound to take out a pitcher, then uh, he was no longer going to manage. So he spent the last 10 years of his life in retirement in Glendale, California, where he lived a great life, just being Casey Stengel. He also was inducted into the Baseball Hall of Fame, and they broke the rules for him, right? Right. They waived the waiting period because of his age. He was now 76. Uh, he was inducted in 1966 with Ted Williams, and Ted, charmingly, kind of kept an eye on Casey all weekend, and made sure he got to where he needed to be and made sure he wasn't overrun by autograph seekers. That was kind of a nice moment. Uh, I think Casey was about the 105th player inducted into the Hall of Fame and probably knew more of the 104 others than anybody else. So he, he passes away, what, 1985, I think? He had cancer, but it was quick, thank gosh. Um, his wife had 1975. 75, did I say 85? 85. At the age of 85. I'm in good shape today. And bless his heart, uh, you know, he, he lost his wife. Uh, she didn't die before he did, but she had a bad stroke, I guess, and she probably had what they would call Alzheimer's today. Yes. His legacy. You ought to put it into a sentence, What? His legacy was being a wonderful ambassador for baseball, for treating everyone 
with importance. If you were in the baseball encyclopedia and you played one game, he concluded you were great. You were good enough to be in the major leagues, even if it was for one day. The autograph seekers at the airport, they were part of the family. He had all the time in the world for them. So he brought the joy of the game for 55 years to this wide net of people. I've been speaking with Marty Appel, author of Casey Stengel, Baseball's Greatest Character. For more information on the book and for other great reads by Marty Appel, visit appelpr.com, spelled A-P-P-E-L. Thanks so much for tuning in to The Hallie Kesser Jane Show, a production of Resec LLC. The Hallie Kesser Jane Show posts new podcasts Wednesdays, 3 p.m. Eastern. Visit HallieKesserJane.com.